If you will, please open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. So good to see everyone this morning. Thankful for the beautiful weather that God's given us of late. And um, thankful for this another day that God has given us to worship Him. And I'm thankful for the time with you today. And, and I pray that our worship today will be done in spirit and truth in a way that's honoring of God and upbuilding for each one. We're going to be in Malachi chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm doing something this morning that I try not to do. Um, and it's not something that happened because I wasn't ready this week and all of a sudden I've found something and put it together. But it's something that, that I've been mulling over for the past couple of months, actually. Um, but my confession is I'm going to preach someone else's basic outline this morning. Um, Gary Henry uh, wrote a sermon that he delivered uh, at a lectureship years ago. I believe it was in 2000, uh, 2011. Um, that he delivered a series of lessons, and I had never heard it before, but I was visiting with a preacher friend of mine uh, back a couple of months ago, and we were just visiting and talking about some various things and the work where he's at and um, just, just, just visiting, and he, he, he mentioned a sermon that he had heard at one time by Gary Henry that had always stood out to him, and he feels like it's a sermon that really needed to be preached. So naturally, I went and found it, and I read through it, and I read through it over and over and over again. And this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach someone else's outline uh, as an effort to let the effectiveness of and the power of what uh, he has put together outweigh my desire for authenticity this morning. Uh, I'm not going to preach his sermon word for word, but I am going to use his basic outline. And I did reach out to him for permission to do that. Um, and he, he was uh, great in extending me that that um, permission. But the topic is the need for restoration. The need for restoration. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you all the main points we're going to talk about this morning are kind of summed up in what I've put as this statement, uh, my just personal overview of this sermon. There's an ongoing need to cautiously consider where we have turned aside. Now, I, I know that might sound interesting to a group of people that oftentimes we consider ourselves born of the restoration movement. You know, I'm not going to go back and talk about the restoration movements throughout uh, the, the past few hundred years. I'm not going to talk about Alexander Campbell because I'm not a Campbellite. As a matter of fact, I disagree with much of what he did when he came about. Um, and we're not going to go back and talk about those things. What we're actually going to do is go back to the Bible and talk about a restoration effort that began that was good and that was necessary, but it failed. And what it's going to do for us is emphasize that even us today at the Church, uh, the Church of Christ at Prince Street in 2023 have an ongoing need to keep coming back to the Bible, not trusting in who came before us and what they decided or the traditions that have been passed down to us, or the beliefs that we've just been held, we, we've just been given from those who came before us. But there is a continual and ongoing need to cautiously consider the fact that there may be places in which we have turned aside. And because of that, restoration is an ongoing thing. So in the book of, uh, you're in Malachi, I want you to stay there. I'm not going to turn and read any of the passages in Ezra and Nehemiah, but Ezra and Nehemiah kind of give us the context for the restoration of the people or the reformation of the people as they've been in captivity, but they've been called back by God. Cyrus issues the decree and they are permitted to go back and they go back and Ezra, of course, is the scribe and the the, worship, the law is read and the worship is restored and the temple is eventually rebuilt and the walls under Nehemiah around the city are also rebuilt. And what we see is this great effort of the people having been released from captivity to restore life in the holy city of Jerusalem and to restore worship in a God-honoring way. Now obviously there are hiccups along the way as they seek to do that. They meet much opposition along the way. The work stops for a little while, but then you have prophets like Haggai that kind of rise up and encourage them to finish the work. But, but certainly we see a period in which those who came back, though they faced much hardship, they were granted the, the opportunity of having the excitement and the undertaking of restoring worship back to the glory that God intended for it to have. 
So why are you in Malachi? Because Malachi, the prophet, is sent about 100 to 150 years later, which when you consider that, that's just, that's within two generations. Malachi is sent to the people because, guess what's happened? Well, what always happens, restoration doesn't stick. The people begin to do decay and to move away from the word that they were called to cling to. And so what you have in Malachi chapter 1, this is a text we've, we've looked at um, in, in a different sermon a long, long, long time ago. And even since then, I believe uh, Matt Smith has been here and preached, and he preached basically that same lesson from Malachi chapter 1 and about how the priests are bringing all these polluted offerings, and it doesn't make sense. They're worshiping and they're bringing sacrifices, but here's the problem. They're bringing the lame, they're bringing the sick in verse 8. And God indicts them on that, and he calls their attention to it, and he says, look, I want you to take those kind of gifts and give them to your governor. And then he asks them the question, will he accept you or will he show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts, and now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any one of you? Remember what he says there in verse 10, oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept any offering from your hand. Verse 12, you profane the offerings. You give polluted offerings. I want you to jump over to chapter 2. Luke is going to read this as our scripture reading and before the second sermon later on, but I'm going to go ahead and read a portion of it now. (coughs) Excuse me. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring. I will spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offspring. You shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi might stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. He turned away from iniquity. He turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people. Inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. When you read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi, the condition of the people and their need for restoration becomes very painfully clear. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to tell you when I'm giving you something word for word from Brother Henry. And here's a list that he came up with. Um, From Malachi chapter 1 and chapter 4, you read about their spiritual apathy. In Nehemiah 13 and Malachi 1 and 2 and 3, you read about the corruption of the priesthood, just as we did there in chapters 1 and chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 1, you read about how in their worship they have degenerated. In Nehemiah chapter 10, 13, and Malachi 3, you read about how they are withholding tithes and offerings. In Nehemiah 10 and 13, you read of how they are breaking the Sabbath. Malachi 2, 3, 2 in chapter 3, you read of their cynicism and the lack of moral discrimination. In Ezra 9, Nehemiah 10, 13, and Malachi 2, you read about disregard for God's marriage law. And in Nehemiah chapter 5 and Malachi chapter 3, you read about how they are neglecting those who are in need. A theme that becomes consistent throughout the prophets and the widows and the orphans and those who are suffering from great injustices, these people are just neglecting them. And it's interesting what actually comes to be true about the great restorers of Ezra and Nehemiah's day 
is that it doesn't take very long before the restorers themselves need restoring. They need to be called back to the word of God. They need to be called back to the true heart of worship. They need to be called back to the way of truth, to the commands of God, and the ways that God has put before them. All I wanted to do with what we've looked at up until now is simply establish this idea that restoration is an ongoing thing. It is foolish for us to talk about restoration as something as having happened in the past. But what we see consistently throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is a continual call to be like the Bereans, to go back to the Word of God, to measure what's being taught, measure what's being practiced against the Word of God, make adjustments where we need to make adjustments. We find that restoration is a daily ongoing thing. The second thing we're going to look at this morning in just a little while, we're going to come back to each one of these, is we're going to look at problems to avoid when undertaking the task of restoration. And at the end, we're going to talk about what about us? Um, where are some areas that that maybe uh, the church of today might focus their attentions not to the neglect of other things, and I want to emphasize that, but might focus their attention where we might look at ourselves and find that maybe we have drifted. But let's talk about this idea of restoration as an ongoing work. What we've illustrated through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi is something that mankind falls prey to. And uh, Gary, in his sermon, refers to it by what he calls the degradation principle. And I'm just going to give you his definition, definition of that. Restoration may, must be an ongoing work because of what I call the degradation principle. The degradation principle says that over time, everything tends to degrade or decay. Nothing can be done and then be left alone. Without constant maintenance, refurbishment, and restoration, things fall into decay. We see it in nature as well as in man-made activities. Unless new energy is infused and efforts are made to return things to their intended state, they fall into disrepair. Can we, I mean, can we mentally just agree with that? We understand what that is. We understand that that happens. Um, if, if, you know, we're having a get-together at our house this, this evening, and so we've been spending time throughout the week just trying to get things ready, and what if... What if last Sunday, Megan had decided, okay, I've got some extra time today. I'm going to spend a little bit of time cleaning up the living room and the kitchen. We're going to all get all the, the kids' toys out. We're going to get all the clothes out. We're going to put the pillows on the couches. I'm going to vacuum. I'm going to mop. Every mop. Everything is going to be exactly where I want it to be. Monday might be okay, right? Because we have this heightened sense of... She put all of this time and attention, she's shaking her head, no, it's not going to last till Monday, and not with our kids, but, but we have this heightened sense of awareness that for a time, there's a, there is a sense of connection between the work that has been spent doing it and the desire to keep it in that condition so that when next Sunday comes, everything is okay, but, but that zeal wears off, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe not like for us by Sunday night or, or Monday, but at least by Tuesday and maybe Wednesday. And what's going to have to happen? Well, there's going to have to be some restoration. There's going to have to be some work to be done to restore it to its former glory. I've used illustrations in the past of, of lighting, liking to get out in the woods and cut and try to clear a lot of our woods and clean a lot of the underbrush. And I do it the old-fashioned style with a chainsaw bent over because it's cheap. And I work my way through, and I'll cut and let it fall. And then after I get through cutting for a while, I'll turn the chainsaw off, and I'll move it all to a burn pile and let it sit for a few weeks, and then I'll burn it. But guess what? What happens, or how does that look like if you come back in three months and it hasn't been touched? Well, those, that underbrush, I mean, it shoots up three feet at a time sometimes overnight, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to keep up with. The thorns and the brambles are very difficult to keep up with unless we give it our constant attention. We understand this principle. And it would be foolish to think that the same thing doesn't happen in our lives individually as Christians, but also in our lives collectively as a congregation. Because just like in the two illustrations that I gave you, it happens so quickly. When we don't give our constant 
attention. It's like the bulletin article this morning. Last week, Mike shared with me uh, something from Andy Sokar's website where he shared something about, I'm not going to tell you what I wrote, but uh, you can read it, but uh, somebody asking the chat GTP, that artificial intelligence stuff, to write them an article that will affirm them in the way they want to live. And at the end of it, the person, this true story from what I can tell on social media, he, he put it on there and he put the verse that the AI put out and, I mean, it sounded pretty legit for the most part. And he wrote at the end of it, he says, I know this is not true, but it gives me comfort. And there are some huge red flags about the whole comfort aspect, especially when you consider the fact it's a lie. Can you really get comfort from a lie? But, but my only reason alluding to this, even though you already have that um, in your fuse with you, is like, do you recognize subtle differences when the word of God is given to you and it's not complete authenticity? The two things mentioned in there are sometimes people reword or even some translations sometimes will word things in a different way. I even mentioned that I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few years there are AI-generated versions of the Bible you can buy on Amazon to affirm whatever lifestyle you want to live. I just think it's coming. I don't know why it wouldn't. And the question is, will you be able to look at that and read it and know and understand and dissect where it transgresses the law of God? Well, the answer to that question is going to depend on how much zeal, how much attention you have given to what is true. The sad thing is many will not be able to recognize the lies, as subtle as they may be, within things like that because we have lost our constant grip on the word of God. We've taken our attention off of it. We had zeal for a moment, but the zeal quickly passed, and all of a sudden we're in this degradation process, and we don't know right from wrong. Our senses and our, 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 our um, um, powers of discernment are not trained by constant practice. And because of that, we don't know where we are, just like the people in this day. Do you remember what Malachi said in Malachi 1? Oh, son, verse, five, verse 6, a son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you? O oh, priest who despise my name. But look what happens next. They respond, these priests respond, and they say, how have we despised your name? What's wrong with that question? What's wrong with it is that they don't know. When they should know. This process has taken such a hold in their life that they don't know their right from their left. They don't know what's true from what's a lie. They don't know what's a subtle difference from what's a drastic difference. They just don't know what's true. When we take our eyes off, it happens quickly. And often very much unnoticed. How have we despised your name? And of course, the Lord goes on to answer them, beginning in verse 7. But I just imagine him asking the question, how is it that you don't know? Degradation happens quickly and oftentimes unnoticed. I mentioned this um, just in passing very quickly, I want to come back to it. Degradation is something that happens or decay, spiritual decay or decline or kind of pulling away from, from the authenticity of the word, the truth of the word, happens both individually and corporately. And I'm going to just, just ex, um, examine this just a little bit closer. Let's look at a couple of passages that remind us of this. I'm not going to spend a whole great deal of time, but we experience it, right? We have times in our lives when we are spiritually we are just grounded in the Lord. We are, we are committed in prayer. We are committed in the word of God. We're committed to God's people. All of these great tools and instruments that God gives us for our upbuilding, for our encouragement. And we are just utilizing them and taking advantage of them. And we get this sky high spiritual standing on the mount like Elijah was when he was on Mount Carmel. And every enemy of God was just absolutely destroyed kind of feeling about ourselves, right? Right? But then it's not very long, and then how do we feel? Through neglect, individually, we start finding things that take precedence over the Word of God, or 
we start finding excuses not to pray, or we start pushing it off to the times of the day where we can't really focus and we can't really pay attention, and we bring our phones into the room with us, and it's going off constantly, and we can't commune with God in a very real, personal way. We start neglecting the times that God gives us with our brethren, that he gives us for stirring one another up. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves feeling weak. We give in to temptation. We don't take hold of the strength that God gives us through Jesus Christ, and we find ourselves in the backside of having sinned with that guilt and that shame, and we just feel weak. We experience, and we know that individual degradation. That's why the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 2.1 says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Or Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10.12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, I almost imagine if I would go back to, to the day of Ezra and Nehemiah and I was to ask them, what do you think the odds would be of in the next 15 to 20 years all this work that you have put into restoration is going to start snowballing out of effect? Maybe, maybe 15, 20 years is, is, is too little, though I think we understand that's really a long time. But What if we just told them that in the next generation, remember we're talking 100 to 150 years after Ezra and Nehemiah's days when Malachi's writing. What if you were to ask them, what do you think would be the odds that in the next generation, or perhaps the following, God is not even going to recognize the worship of your people? And it's not because they're not trying to worship. It's not because they're not trying to sacrifice. But it's because their hearts are far from him. And that manifests itself in the things they're bringing and things they're doing to God. And I almost wonder if they might confidently say, no, that can't happen. But certainly that seems to be the case. We must guard ourselves against this process in our lives. We understand Satan, the enemy of God, and the enemy of us, as those who are followers of God, is always seeking to find a foothold in the door. And it, we're made aware of that in passages like 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8 where he's like a, a prowling lion seeking someone to devour. We also learn it in passages like Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 26, right? Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What does he say next? Give no opportunity to the devil. We have to guard and protect ourselves against this and we could... We could divert now and go to Ephesians chapter 6 and we could talk about the shield of faith and protecting ourselves by grounding ourselves in firm convictions in the word of God. I'm not going to do that this morning. But we understand, at least this morning, that we have to guard individually against it. But not just individually, corporately. Look in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I've got verse 4 and 5 on the screen, but I'm going to read more than that. Revelation chapter 2. So I'm going to go ahead and turn there. Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 2. In writing to the church at Ephesus, writing to the church at Ephesus, it says in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. So far, so far things sound pretty good, right? They've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and they've found them to be false. A plus, thumbs up. Verse 3, I know you're enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. I mean, just close the book, right? These guys are doing great. These ladies and gentlemen, they're doing great. These Christians are holding firm to the faith. But that's not the end. Verse 4, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Suddenly everything that sounded so great about this church at Ephesus now takes a spiral downhill at the bottom of which the Lord warns if, if you don't engage in this process of correction, if you, don't, if you don't start finding your way back to the church in its glory, if you don't realize where you have strayed and start working to get 
back. He says, I'm going to remove your lampstand, which is a figurative way in the book of Revelation for saying, I'm not going to recognize you as a church anymore, as my church. It's kind of interesting here in this context. They recognize the ones who speak truth. They recognize the ones who speak falsehoods. They are faithfully holding true to the word of the Lord. Yet the accusation, again, is that they have abandoned the love that they had at first. I I personally believe that what he's highlighting here is a heart issue that manifests itself in love towards others and acts of love. That's why he immediately, when he says repent, he says do the works that you did at First, I think, I think he's calling them to a heart corrective that works itself out in very visible ways. They've lost their zeal. They've lost their, their, their love for being the people that God has called them to be. But, but again, here's the idea. Restoration is an ongoing work, both individually and corporately. Let's come back to our list now. Therefore, right, it would be foolish to rest our confidence in previous efforts. If there was some good, there's a reason I don't talk about these things, uh, a personal reason I don't talk about these things, and a lot of it has to do with accusations of who we are, and it's not true. I don't talk about history in the past few hundred years in restoration efforts to get us back, because at the end of the day, I want to make sure I'm not following those people. And so, Though I'm thankful for whatever good they may have done, at the end of the day, as far as my preaching goes, I don't care. I want to go all the way back. I want to go all the way back and I want to see what it is, what is it that they are measuring themselves by. Because then we might have something in common. But I'm the follower of no man. We are the follower of no man except the man Jesus Christ who was God, who took on flesh. I think we have to be very careful about putting confidence in previous restoration efforts. Maybe even things that our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents were involved in, and I'm not thinking of anything specifically. I'm just talking in general principle here. The call is the same through all of these things. It is a continual call to deal appropriately with degradation by a continual return to the Word. Always evaluating ourselves with honesty, courage, and repentance. That's the call, right? That's the call that Paul, that's the call that Paul gives Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and in verse 15 when he says, the King James Version, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know some of your versions, like mine, the ESV, will say, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. But if you keep reading down, you can understand immediately in the context there that there's a direct correlation to the study of the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Here's the call, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Unto who? Not some previous restorationist. Again, I'm thankful for whatever good someone may have done, but But at the end of the day, I am to study to show myself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And then in James chapter 1, as I come to understand the truth of God, even if it causes me to change my mind about something, even, even if, yes, Even if it causes me to believe something that's contrary to what my mommy or my daddy taught me. Absolutely. Even if. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God and we rightly discern the word of truth. We are James chapter 1, 21, 22 to receive with meekness, humility, gentleness. Not in opposition, not in rebellion. We are to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It is in Isaiah chapter 66 and in verse 2 that this is written, this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit 
who trembles at my word. And again, Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 1 issues the call, emphasizes the call, put exclamation points at the end of the call. We must give more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest we drift away. So coming back and zooming back out, we deal with this idea there is an on going need because of this principle, this degradation principle, this principle of decay when something is left unchecked and unmonitored and undealt with and uncared for. There is an ongoing need for restoration as we cautiously consider what the Word of God is calling us to do. But as we engage in this ongoing process, individually, but also collectively as a congregation, there are some things to be on guard against, things to take heed of. And I think we, we, we see them in many past historical restoration things. Um, we, we, we see some problems, we see some pitfalls that take place. Even those who may speak of, of associations with men like Alexander Campbell, one of the things that's interesting about him is at first he was completely opposed to the idea of missionary societies, and by the end of his life he was the head of one. And we see what happens when, 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 when someone takes their eye off of the standard. When someone takes their eye off of the thing that they know to be false or untrue or, or a slight variation of something that was meant to be presented in its purity. Remember Galatians chapter 1, Paul says any version of the gospel that's not the pure gospel is not the gospel at all. There is a continual need throughout this process to make sure that we are not measuring by the wrong standard. Well, what wrong standard might we be measuring by? Well, I think, I think contextually with what we're talking about, one of the greatest, the, the, the most obvious wrong standards we often measure by is previous generations. What do they do? Well, that's, that's not a good question. You need to keep going back further and further and further, and you need to go all the way back to when the, ap the, the apostolic traditions are being laid down. And we need to ask the question, what did they do? We've got to make sure that we are continually this people, that Isaiah calls us to be a people who humble themselves and have that contrite spirit, and we tremble at the word of God and nothing else. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul emphasizes that as well. He says, I'm not trying to please man. If I were trying to please man, I wouldn't be a servant of God. And so I'm not trying to fall in line with what somebody else has done before me. I'm trying to fall in line with what God's word, given by the Holy Spirit through inspired man, has revealed, confirmed, and preserved for me. I want to make sure that I'm planting my feet there and there alone. A second problem that often <clears throat> that often presents itself, and I think we could probably identify with this one, each one on an individual basis, at least as we reflect throughout our lives, is, is oftentimes, oftentimes we'll come into the Word of God. And, and I struggle with this, especially as a preacher, uh, and, and, and I'll openly, uh, openly say that, but I'll sit down with the Word of God and something will convict me and something will be powerful. And instead of letting it sit in my heart for 30 minutes or for an hour, what do I do as a preacher? I immediately start figuring out how to weave it into a sermon. Right? And that's something that I have to guard against. And that's not wrong. I'm supposed to declare the whole counsel of God. But first, I need to make sure that I'm letting it sit with me first. And I think sometimes that's how we listen to sermons or listen in Bible classes is we, we, we listen for the things that people around us need to hear or we're, we're entertained, by, entertained by constant discussion on what all the other religions are doing wrong and it makes us feel good and it makes us feel as though our feet are firmly planted and we fall to the problem of not seeing the need for personal repentance. There is a place for all that, by the way. We need to identify what is not true and what is false. And we need to preach of the needs of the congregation. I can't tell you how many times people, not necessarily here, nothing that stuck out to me at least. There may have been something I just don't remember. But specifically when I've been other places, I can remember word-for-word -word comments that I've gotten that are along the lines of, 
Did you preach that at me? Because if so, that's the most hateful and disgusting thing you could have ever done. Like I was taking advantage of them, and I wasn't. I was preaching a sermon that just fell where, ironically, it needed to fall. Someone said it this way to me when I was confiding and seeking counsel in response to it. Uh, one, of the, one of the men, you may not like this phrase, but it, it makes sense. When you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that screams is the one that got hit. And I don't mean any ill will when I prepare sermons, but the purpose of preaching is to convict the hearts of man. It's not for us to use the Word of God as a mirror in the sense of reflecting it to somebody else. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, I want you to look at what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7. You probably knew exactly where I was going with this in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount towards the end. Sermon on the Mount 5 through 7 of Matthew. And right here in those first few verses, notice what Jesus does. He says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. How many times have you heard that verse quoted? wrongly. And that kind of goes back to in your article, I put, I put something about sometimes words are twisted, but sometimes contexts are twist, twisted. And here's uh, in Matthew chapter 4, that's what, that's what Satan does with Jesus. And here's an example of people pulling this pa- passage out of, uh, out, out of context and saying, well, we're not supposed to be judging one another. That's not what it's about. It's about not judging one another hypocritically. As a matter of fact, at the end of this, he says, once you've taken care of yourself, verse 5, then you can see clearly to do what? Make a judgment on somebody else. But he says in verse 2, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. One of the problems we typically fall to so often is not seeing the need. And again, I struggle with this too, and I wholeheartedly embrace that, but I want to do better. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. We, we recognize it and acknowledge it, and we seek to make changes, but we need to make sure that we are seeing the need in all things for personal repentance. Here's something that happens oftentimes is the idea of one of the problems in, in restoration is that we go too far. Or sometimes we don't go far enough. And I, I think we can recognize the, the tendency that we have sometimes when someone is preaching something false, instead of, that, that by the way we think on a spectrum of, of, of digits or steps, we may say, well, this is two points to the left of center where things are ought to be. I think our tendency sometimes is we, we, we are so disgusted by the idea that someone would do that, despite the fact that we know we do it from time to time as well, that instead of wanting to take two steps back to center, we want to go to the other extreme, right? We want to get as far away from that view as we possibly can, and so oftentimes we'll go way too far to the extent that now we've got a new tradition that we're binding on people and measuring their faith by it, and that's just not right. That's not what God calls us to do. Sometimes we're just prone to extremes, And in times of restoration, I think this becomes a very dangerous tendency that either we go too far or sometimes we simply do not go far enough. And then this one. I'm going to close with this one and then we'll pick back up in the second sermon. A lot of times we limit our reform to externals. We start, he acknowledges this in his sermon, and of course I think we can identify with it, and it's, it's, um, we see it. Uh, There's, in the name of restoration, we see all sorts of things being done, don't we? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna get back to simple Christianity, so we're gonna, we're gonna dress a little bit more casual, we're gonna get the pews out, we're gonna move the chairs in, we're gonna get all circled up, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that as if it makes a difference in the world. And oftentimes we limit our reform to things like this and we fail to see, I like the statement he makes here, the restoration efforts that are made concerning only external practices 
that fail to address the inward character and ty- attitude. He says this type of restoration accounts to little more than rearranging chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Doesn't matter. But what we see so often, as in Nehemiah's day, is that though there is a need to get things right, right? Josiah's reforms were largely centered around what the law said and getting, re- getting rid of the idols and the altars to false gods and restoring accurate worship. The externals are necessary. But I think what happens more often is that what deteriorates is the hearts of God's people. As we see in the book of Malachi. The deeper need of our day Not deeper because we need to neglect the other, but because we need to recognize that we need personal repentance for us first and foremost, is what he says is the restoration of the spirit of the apostolic Christianity, including, and this is where we'll pick up in our second sermon, the otherworldly outlook of Christians in the New Testament, the spirit of sacrifice, their radical reverence. If restorationists do not address issues like these, their reforms will be superficial. I'm going to pause right there, but let's conclude with a quick word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, God, as we seek to study this issue, Father, help us to do it honestly and courageously. Father, help us to, to determine and commit ourselves to coming into your word, knowing you through your word, being satisfied with your word, finding peace joy and comfort in your word, and living and walking therein, Father. There is no standard to which we can appeal that is going to bring us to life and peace. Father, we pray that we would strive to be the people that you would have us to be, and that we would strive with more and more fervor each day, Father. And we pray that you would forgive us where we have failed. Father, bless us now as we go to our Bible classes and bless these little children, Father, as they learn about your word. And it's through your son's name that we pray. Amen.